Hey everyone, this is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, and today I want to discuss with you the passage in Matthew 13 where we read that Jesus was rejected in his hometown at Nazareth. So here's the text, Matthew chapter 13, 53 and following. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, that is, Nazareth area, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary? And his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Folks, this is a sad but unfortunately accurate commentary on how people view success when it comes home. In many cases, they remember the past, and they don't bother to investigate the present. Now, Luke has a much fuller version of this, which we'll study when we get there. But for now, think of what they said about him to disqualify him. He's the carpenter's son. We know his mother. His brothers are here with us. Where did this man get all these things? They disdained him because they knew him before. Before he was anointed, before he began to preach, he was always the mighty Son of God. He just didn't show them. So now this rejection is a huge event and we kind of have to ask why it happened and why it's so important. Now of course Jesus was rejected because of his countrymen's unbelief. That's clear from verse 58. But what led them to that conclusion? Why did they reject him? Well, first, he was just too ordinary. To them, Jesus was just another man, eldest son of the carpenter. They knew his mom, his brothers and sisters, and many had probably hired him to do work on their houses. Then he goes off and becomes famous. Now, this is probably more simple envy than anything else. Why is he so special? But this brings up several points that are of great importance. Number one is this. Jesus is man. One of the early heresies in the ancient church was called docetism from the word dokeo to seem. That word, that heresy asserted that Jesus was not really and fully a man, just a sort of an apparition. He seemed human and real, but he was not. If you look at the end of the New Testament in 1 John chapter 4, you read this, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Sound statement. But every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, or does not confess Jesus, if you have one of the more modern versions. The point being that you don't just say, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is an amazing individual. You understand, acknowledge, and state that you know he is both man and God. And John concludes this by saying, This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and it's now already in the world. So, to confess that Jesus is fully human, that you could touch him, talk with him, eat with him, that he did the human things that people do, 
is just as important as believing he is God manifest in the flesh. Both are crucial, and one without the other is the spirit of Antichrist. I didn't say that. John said it, the Apostle John, who laid his head on Jesus' breast, who wrote the Gospel of John, who wrote this book, who wrote the book of Revelation. If anyone would know that Jesus was a real man, it would be John. So now this passage does some interesting things. It adds eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus didn't just look like a man. He is man. He was a carpenter's son. His mother was Mary. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph moved to Nazareth, we think, when Jesus was a small boy, and all the townspeople watched him grow up. They knew his brothers and sisters. In other words, Jesus was ordinary. He was so ordinary that his early acquaintances wouldn't think of him otherwise. He's just a man. He's like you and me. Or if you're, if you're female, like a girl, this reality that Jesus Christ is a man is hard to grasp because we revere him as the Son of God. What put the Nazarenes off was not his connection to humanity because they couldn't miss that. I mean, they ate with him. They touched him. They watched him work. They saw him with his brothers and his mom and probably Joseph earlier on. What they couldn't believe was that somebody so completely ordinary could be the Messiah and Son of God. Furthermore, this passage specifically identifies Jesus' family as familiar to the Nazarenes. They knew his mom. Joseph had apparently died by this time. They knew his brothers and sisters. Not only was Jesus ordinary, his family was ordinary. Just a Jewish family that went to synagogue on Saturday, Sabbath. They knew his they knew his whole existence, so to speak, from the outside. Jesus had both brothers and sisters, and his mother was apparently a widow. Now, as to the idea that Mary was a perpetual virgin with no other children than Jesus, I'm not going to discuss that here except to say, what's your first impression when you read this? What do you automatically think? I'm going to leave that right there. And this is how they responded to him. They were offended at him. Now, if you want to know just how offended, look at Luke 44, 28, 29, where the Nazarenes actually tried to kill him. They wanted to push him off a cliff because he had said things that offended them in his sermon, which he gave after he stood up and read the passage from Isaiah in the synagogue. Luke 4 gives a lot more detail than Matthew, including Jesus' reading of Isaiah and his sermon. Now, this final analysis of Jesus' ministry in Nazareth is as follows. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And if you think about it, he didn't do many mighty works. He was almost shoved off a cliff. We could almost say, what ministry? But I want you to think of yourself for a moment. What would you have done? I mean, look honestly at yourself. You see this guy, he's wearing his usual clothes, but he's now a famous rabbi. He's a miracle worker. He's done things that people can't even describe. You'd think to, would you think to yourself, hometown boy makes good? But see, he's the same guy you thought you knew, but you really didn't know him. And it's Im immensely important that you and I look at people the way God sees them. That's kind of an aside here. Although that was what was wrong with these Nazarenes, they were blinded by familiarity. 
Now I want to make an application here that is very important to you if you were raised in a Christian home. This happens a lot with people raised in a Christian home. They know the songs, they know the teachings, they've memorized the Bible verses, they're familiar. But the familiar they have, and if that's you, is superficial. It's a huge way, folks, the devil deceives you, if I'm talking to you, and you need to ask God to show you the reality of knowing Jesus Christ for real. Or, as my teenagers used to say when they were younger, my oldest is now in his 50s, for reals. You need to know Jesus Christ for reals. And here is your weapon against that blindness of familiarity. It's prayer. Pray that you may really see. Humble yourself before God. Pray that your eyes may be enlightened so that you understand the greatness of Christ, of our God, of our salvation. Now, music is also good for that, especially music that describes Jesus our Lord as he is. I think of the Lion and the Lamb, one of the great Christian songs of recent years. Pray to see the Lord as he really is. It's not wrong to ask for a vision. It's just possible that you might get what you ask for. So be careful what you ask for. You might get it. Here's what Isaiah saw. In the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it, that is the throne, stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one of the seraphim cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. We don't see that all the time, but we should. The posts of the door, that is the temple, were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke, the Shekinah glory. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. <clears throat> and, folks, you will find that once you truly understand who Jesus is, you will see everything differently. Ask to see and understand. You will not reject him after you do. He will show you himself. It's yours for the asking, as so many things are. You have not because you ask not, said James. And when you ask, you will receive. And if you don't, if you're not asking, <clears throat> don't expect, although it may come because sometimes it does. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful day. This is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, signing off.